So maybe while we're waiting for more people to join us, uh, if you guys want to introduce yourself, tell me a bit more about yourself and uh, what kind of background you guys have in uh, blockchain in general or distributed systems programming. So I kind of know my audience. Or we can just wait for people to join us. Is that, can you hear me? I cannot hear anyone. Um, let's see, I do have, I'm not muted and. Um, um, does this work? Can you hear Megan? Actually, maybe uh, I should try calling in from the phone, and that might help. Megan, I can I can hear you. So she has something. Niba, mm -hmm. Niba has something to do. Her speaker. Oh, Nadia can't hear, but but you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, I was just going to um, introduce myself. Um, I'm Megan Reinhardt. I live in New York, and I'm a senior product manager. I'm with at and so I've been in product for about five years. And I do, um, I do like a course in Ruby on Rails, but I'm pretty much a junior developer, more of a business lead. Um, so I am, yeah, just here to, um, to learn about Hyperledger Flat. Um, Villager and um, there are five participants in the meeting. Uh, hey guys, so I just joined, um, I just joined like the uh call. I'm not using my computer audio because I don't think it's working properly. Uh, did anyone say anything that I missed? No, uh, okay, so um, it's 10, it's five minutes past 10. Uh, I think we should just get started. We only have three people or four people. Uh, in the call. Um, I don't know if uh, more people are going to join. Uh, are you guys all remote or are you guys in a room so you guys know if there are more people who are going to come join us? Um, yes, I guess uh, I can get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Nava and uh, in the next one hour we are going to be doing a very, uh, a very crash course into Hyperledger Fabric. So a bit about, about myself, um, I'm an engineer by training and um, I work at a bank in the cybersecurity space. Uh, I've been uh, in the blockchain uh, industry for like over a year now and I also teach blockchain and hyperledger fabric CCPC at uh, the Blockchain Hub out of York University here in Toronto. And here I am today, uh, I'm going to be uh, in the next one hour, actually let me go to the agenda then. So, uh, in the next one hour, um, I'm going to try to tackle a lot of things. I think uh, blockchain, uh, blockchain and hyperledger fabric in itself, uh, it's a huge topic. So uh, some of you guys might find it very, uh, like you might think I, I like rushed over a lot of things. If that is the uh, case, please tell me to like uh, deep dive into a concept which uh, was not clear or which I did not cover in detail because there's a lot of material to cover. Um, so we will uh, do a quick introduction to blockchain. Uh, then we are going to do uh, like a little deep dive into Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, it's going to be followed by uh, the functionalities of Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, we will talk about its module and its architecture. And uh, then we are going to look at what identity, uh, membership, nodes, all of that in Ledger, uh, all of what all of these mean in the Hyperledger Fabric world. Uh, I will also describe the real world use case of Hyperledger Fabric. In fact, it's going to be a, a small video that we're going to watch, uh, not very long. And um, I was going to do a hands-on tutorial where we would build an end-to-end Hyperledger Fabric application using the Node.js SDK. But I'm having issues with my laptop, so we won't be like internet is really slow, and I need uh, I need to connect uh, to the uh, to Docker to uh, pull images. So that will not really work. But I will show you guys uh, an application I have that I was going to demo and run uh, run through with you guys and. Uh, we will be looking at the chain code I wrote, uh, and we'll also look at the 
Node.js application that would be that could have been used to interact with the uh, blockchain network once we deployed it. And at the end, if there are any questions uh, from you guys, then I can answer that. Or you guys can also just like uh, send me a message. So uh, yeah, I guess we're now gonna go into the introduction. So I'm sure like uh, everyone here in the audience uh, has heard of Bitcoin or they know of it because like from a lot of conversations that I've had, uh, that is one reason uh, many people got into blockchain in the first place. Uh, but some people uh, tend to confuse uh, blockchain uh, with Bitcoin, and so like we're going to start this one uh, hour webinar by asking ourselves what is blockchain, how it's different from Bitcoin, and then we're going to answer the question of what is hyperledger fabric. Let me see if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, I guess there are no questions. Yeah, what is blockchain? Uh, there's a book by Dan and Alex Tapscott in which uh, it's called Blockchain Revolution, and they describe blockchain as the new Web 2.0. Uh, some have even called it the next internet. Uh, so it's a very um, it's a very uh, big comparison, I feel, uh, to call it uh, to call, uh, compared to uh, being the next internet. It really brings us to, to the question, what is it? What is blockchain? And uh, in the simplest words, uh, it's a network of nodes. There is really nothing novel about the technology itself. It's built upon uh, existing concepts of um, uh, public uh, key cryptography and uh, P2P networks. And it's the way the uh, two concepts have been combined that makes blockchain so no a novel. But really, at the end of the day, it's just a distributed database um, which immutably records all the transactions uh, that are taking place in the network. And uh, it's immutable because of uh, public key cryptography that it uses and the guarantee that it provides that a transaction cannot be modified, uh, therefore making blockchain an append-only system. Uh, so now it brings us to the next question, how is it different from Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency which was built on top of blockchain. Uh, it's like, a, like you guys, I, I would think, like, have you used Google Map or a similar application before? Google Maps needs internet to retrieve directions and show it to others. It needs internet to, uh, to trace addresses, etc. So internet is the blockchain which enables Google Maps. If the app Google Maps disappears, internet will not cease to exist. However, if internet disappears, Google Maps will pretty much be useless. You cannot even access Google Maps. And this is the uh, same relationship between Bitcoin and blockchain. You can have blockchain, the underlying technology behind Bitcoin, without having Bitcoin. However, you cannot have Bitcoin without blockchain. So we know what blockchain is. It was a very high level uh, introduction to blockchain. Uh, we know how it's different uh, from Bitcoin, which really made it so popular. Now we're going to answer our next question, what is Hyperledger Fabric? So Hyperledger Fabric is a blockchain implementation, a blockchain framework implementation. Uh, it was initially contributed by Digital Asset and IBM. Hyperledger Fabric with its modular architecture and plug and play capability uh, serves as a foundation for developing permissioned or private blockchain uh, applications. So ready to put it in that, uh, Someone saying something? Uh, no, okay. So to put it in another way, uh, Hyperledger Fabric is a framework to create enterprise applications with uh, network security, scalability, confidentiality, and performance really uh, in a modular blockchain architecture. So now we're going to talk about Hyperledger Fabric functionality. Uh, the screenshot up there is taken from uh, Hyperledger Fabric's official website, uh, and you can take a minute to read it. Uh, they're, uh, they're listing the key features of the platform. It says that uh, cha there are channels for sharing confidential information, which is what makes it, uh, makes it private. Blockchain, uh, there's order and service to deliver transactions, consistency to peers in the network, endorsement policies for transactions that uses CloudDB as the underlying database for uh, uh, world state support. It has its own uh, membership service provider. Uh, so like uh, for the person who's like, 
understanding my pressure fiber for the first time, it all seems like a mouthful. And so uh, I guess in the next section, I'm going to break down what these functionalities are and what they really mean. Uh, so one of the main features of hyperledger fabric is identity management. It provides a membership service, membership identity service that manages user IDs and authenticates all participants in the blockchain network. This is what it, uh, enables you to have a private blockchain feature, which is a huge differentiator from other blockchains like Ethereum, where everything is public and everything is open. Uh, furthermore, uh, hyperledger fabric in, uh, allows enforcement of access control on specific network operations. So as an example, you can have a node on the blockchain that is allowed to invoke a smart contract, but not deploy new smart contracts. And in Hyperledger speak, uh, a smart contract is called chain code. They're interchangeable, really. Uh, and in fact, moving forward, I'm going to use uh, chain code and not smart contract uh, to refer, it, uh, refer to it. So that is identity management. That's one of the features of Hyperledger fabric. Another interest, and the reason it needs identity management is because uh, it's because of the concept of uh, private blockchains and the need to uh, not be anonymous. The second feature of hyperledger fabric is, uh, and it's a very interesting one, is privacy and confidential uh, confidentiality. It is uh, its ability to enable multiple organizations, which all of which require uh, private confidential transactions, to exist on the same blockchain network. And it achieves this by uh, way of having private channels or subnets that allow for transaction privacy and confidentiality. So say you have like two channels on a blockchain net, uh, network, channel A and channel B. Members in channel A can transact without their transactions, member information or channel information, leading to nodes in channel B. And vice versa, members in channel B can transact with each other without members in channel A uh, finding out what the transactions are and what the data associated with the transaction is, all the while uh, with both channel A and channel B and the associated members being on the same network. So, by simply speaking, uh, channel A and channel B are invisible and inaccessible to each other, even though they're on the same network. So, uh, efficient processing. Not, you know, typical. Uh, Blockchain application, you can have thousands of transactions happening every second. And despite being distributed, massive amounts of transactions can build up and slow down the network. And this is the case for uh, Fabric, is the case for Ethereum, and really any distributed application. Hyperledger Fabric uh, tries to solve this by providing concurrency and parallelism to the network. And it achieves this by separating transaction execution from transaction ordering and commitment. So, uh, concurrency and parallelism uh, in this context results in increased processing efficiency on each node and also accelerates the delivery of transactions to the ordering service. And we'll talk in more detail about pure nodes and ordering service shortly. But for now, it's sufficient for us to understand that Hyperledger Fabric assigns network roles of transaction processing, ordering, and commitment by node type. And these roles are executed in parallel thereby increasing the throughput and uh, throughput uh, in the net, uh, network. So finally, one of the features of uh, Hyperledger Fabric is modular architecture. Algorithms for identity, ordering, encryption, etc. they can all be uh, plugged into any Hyperledger Fabric network, and this allows the application to interoperate across markets, regulatory and geographic boundaries, because again, Hyperledger Fabric says, as an enter says itself as an enterprise uh, blockchain platform to so need uh, that bit of modularity to uh, to uh, suit uh, to itself to those specific use cases. So this was about uh, this was all about Hyperledger Fabric's functionalities. It was a very if there's any uh, if anyone wants more explanation on any of them, please like uh, raise that question towards the end of the uh, presentation because I do know uh, these are uh, difficult concepts. Next, uh, we are going to talk about the design features of Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, assets, chain code, uh, ledger features, privacy through channels, uh, security, and MSC, all consensus, um, all of which we kind of touched upon uh, previously. So, uh, we will begin with assets. An asset is anything uh, that represents tangible or intangible 
thing that can be exchanged over Hyperledger Fabric Network using chain code transactions or smart contract transactions. And in general, blockchain speak, it is what is exchanged in a transaction from one node to another. So in the, in the example of a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin is the asset which is being uh, exchanged between the nodes or participants in the network. Again, like, on the topic of chain code, uh, this is a software. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I think like, is there like some latency in uh, uh, how the presentation has been delivered? I feel my laptop is slower. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving on, uh, so chain code, uh, this is the software that is running on the ledger, uh, which encodes the assets and business logic for modifying these assets. Uh, next is ledger feature. Um, so ledger is really the sequence or central resistance record of all the state transactions, the transitions that are taking place in the network of Hyperledger Fabric. These state transitions, uh, they are a result of chain code transactions of a set of assets submitted by participating parties. And because you have a private channel with a, a private, you have a private blockchain platform with uh, uh, channels to ensure privacy, there is one ledger per channel. And each peer maintains a copy of the uh, ledger for each channel uh, of which they are a member of. So you can have a certain a node which was like a member of the three channels. And in this case, uh, this node will maintain three ledgers on its machine, one for each of the three channels. Is that making sense to everyone? Okay. Uh, next up is privacy two channels. And we've already talked quite a bit about channels, private channels, and privacy. I'm not going to repeat everything here. Um, I just want to I just emphasize that Hyperledger Fabric uses the concept of one ledger per channel. And this channel can be shared across the entire network, or it can be limited to include only certain nodes on the network, effectively making it a private channel. And all the assets transferred across a node, uh, across the network in the channel are encrypted and can only be decrypted by nodes that have the private key that was used to create the original ciphertext. So all in all, and this is like a huge sale of hyperledger fabric, uh, it's a very secure platform and uh, a network which can be, it supports a network which can be private. Uh, security and membership services. So, um, I believe the fabric network is such that every participant has a unique identity, which, were, which is created using public uh, key cryptography. And as it is true for any blockchain, uh, not just hyperledger fabric, uh, but with, with hyperledger fabric, uh, this unique identity, which is tied to organizations, uh, network components, and end users or client applications, um, along with the existence and capabilities of private channels. To help address scenarios where privacy and confidentiality are paramount concerns. So, if you if you can have a, you can have an enterprise use case where anonymity is not it's not uh, possible or it's something that has to be addressed with, then you, you get a security and membership services that you can use to tie back transactions to users who are represented using the public key. Consent uh, allows for flexible and scalable consensus algorithms. And um, I guess when we speak of uh, consensus, consensus in hyperledger fabric, uh, we're talking about the full social verification of the correctness of a set of transactions uh, that comprise a block in the network. And this includes everything from proposal and endorsement, ordering, validation, and commitment. What is interesting about the way hyperledger fabric achieves consensus is that it is at a transaction level, and I mentioned it earlier. This means that only the nodes that were participating in a certain transaction are part of achieving consensus. Other nodes don't need to participate. And this is uh, very different from other blockchains like Bitcoin, which use proof of work or other uh, incentivizing mechanisms uh, to have a node participate in a transaction. And, um, I believe the fabric is also very interesting in that it allows users to plug and play with the consensus algorithm that determines ordering. The default consensus algorithm is called uh, practical Byzantine force tolerance, and it's based on uh, Sasser and Nichols' words that you can look up. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about that algorithm. 
but you can disable even like the default uh, open census algorithm altogether. Uh, for example, if you're deploying it in one organization only, uh, where the actors are all part of the same organization, you don't really need consensus in that uh, scenario. So you can just disable consensus altogether, or you can enable it. Uh, you can use by a practical Byzantine force tolerance, or you can bring in your own uh, consensus algorithm and plug that in. So it's a very uh, pluggable architecture in a lot of sense, like uh, consensus, MSP, all of that is plug and play uh, when it comes to library fabric, depending on what your use case and scenario is. Identity. Uh, so now I think we have the basics out of the way. Uh, uh, we will dig. Uh, I, I think now I'm going to talk in more detail about identity. Uh, and I'll talk about membership and notes. And we're going to start with identity. So identity. We're going to tackle uh, the following questions. We're going to ask ourselves what's an identity. Uh, what are PTIs, digital certificates, authentication, and private public keys, certificate authorities. And certificate revocation list. Um, yeah, so like each actor in a blockchain network, be it pure nodes, or the nodes, endorsers, whoever, they all have a unique identity with a size to a digital certificate. And the default is an S509 digital certificate, but this can be customized in the membership service provider. Uh, and we'll talk about pure nodes, or the nodes, and other and membership service after our conversation on identity, but I don't want to sidetrack. So yes, uh, each node or actor has an identity tied to a digital certificate, and uh, this identity or certificate determines what permissions a user or actor in the network has. For example, can they invoke a chain code or a smart contract? Can they deploy a new chain code? Access management, stuff like that. Very important uh, to the concept of identity in hyperledger fabric is that it's verifiable and traceable, and this is very different from Bitcoin or other blockchains, uh, which rely on anonymity. So, uh, like, I guess the point I'm trying to uh, run with is that identity in hyperledger fabric is verifiable and traceable, and therefore must come from a trusted authority. And in hyperledger fabric, this trusted authority is your PKI certificate authority. PKI, for anyone who's new to this concept, is the acronym for Public Key Infrastructure. Uh, the PKI essentially is a collection of internet technologies that provide secure communication to the network. It dispenses many different kinds of verifiable identities by issuing digital certificates to parties uh, who can then use them for authentication. And these certificates are not valid for infinity. Uh, they may expire, they may even be revoked. And this list of invalid certificates is maintained in a CA certificate of a revocation list. And this uh, concept of revocation is important because if uh, there's ever a scenario where, uh, say, like some nodes were compromised and they hack, uh, then you can revoke their CA uh, certificate and add them to the certificate uh, revocation list. Uh, membership. So I, me I mem mentioned membership service provider in the next slide. Um, let's talk a bit more about that. So we know from the last topic that a PTI provides verifiable identity through a chain of trust. A membership service provider determines if such a given identity is a trusted member of that blockchain network or channel. That is to say, like, this certificate authority is trusted uh, to define members of a domain or organization on the network. This can be done either by listing the identities of the members or, or by identifying Certificate authorities are authorized to issue valid identities for the uh, members, or through a combination of both, really. So, so I guess yeah, this is like I think a great example. Uh, I use this as uh, an example of tying in all of the three concepts we just spoke about: uh, uh, identity, PCI, and MSP. So, like you can think of identity in a blockchain network. Like, say you're traveling to a country, your identity in in a blockchain network is like a passport. And this passport is issued by your government, who in our jargon is the PTI or public infrastructure. And when you want to travel to a different country with your passport, agreement between your home country and the host country will determine if you need a visa before flying out or if you can get a visa on arrival, things like that. And these agreements which enforce your identity and 
permissions to land and enter a country, they are like the membership service provider of blockchain, of uh, not blockchain, of uh, hyperledger fabric. So now we are going to talk about nodes. Uh, this is the most basic concept of blockchain, uh, but like you are now thinking that I should uh, cover it first. And we will talk about this now. Um, so what are nodes? Uh, a node is the communication entity of the blockchain. Think of it as Think of it as a domain which talks to the network. You can have multiple servers grouped into one domain, and all of that represents one. All of those uh, servers represent one domain in, in the network, or one node in the network. And you can have three kinds of nodes: uh, client node, peer node, and other node. A client node represents the end user. It must connect to uh, a peer to communicate to the blockchain. And uh, clients create and invoke transactions. We also broadcast the transaction to the ordering service. A peer node receives ordered state updates from the ordering service, and uh, they also maintain the state and copy of the blockchain. Additionally, they can act as an endorser. So, an endorser or endorsing uh, peer is an that just endorses a transaction before it is committed to the ledger. <coughs> Next is um, ordering nodes. So an ordering node is a node running the communication service, which implements a delivery guarantee, such as atomic or social broadcast. Um, so when clients connected to the channel submit a transaction, it is first sent to this ordering node, and these ordering nodes ensure that all transactions are delivered to all the peers in the same logical order. Um, and when these ordering nodes uh, they send out uh, these transactions to the peers, these uh, transactions become candidates for inclusion to the blockchain or to the ledger. And you can have more than one ordering node. Uh, together, collectively, they will form the ordering service. And this ordering service can be implemented in different ways, from a centralized service to distributed protocols uh, that target different networks and nodes. All, to, um, all, all of this is like, uh, uh, it depends on the architecture you uh, come up with for your uh, application using Fabric. So um, I think I covered a lot. Uh, yeah, it's like 10:30. I covered a lot in the past half hour. Um, we talked about blockchain and Bitcoin. We talked about hyperledger fabric features, architecture. Um, I covered a lot of concepts uh, that are uh, fundamental to hyperledger fabric uh, in a very uh, high-level uh, view. Uh, next, like I want to wrap up the half, first half an hour by just taking a quick look at the use case uh, where I'll actually be playing like a video. Uh, like also how Walmart is using hyperledger fabric uh, in ensuring uh, in the supply chain of uh, food. Uh, we'll take a quick look at that. Actually, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, I have the browser open. Let me share. I'm not sure, like, uh, is, oh, I can see the chat there. Never mind. Uh, oh, I'm so, like, you can hear. Was everyone able to hear me? Because I just uh, saw this message from uh, Aisha that she could barely hear me. Mm. Uh, uh, how about everyone else? Uh, Marie, Meg, question. Uh, yeah, it's like I was. I guess I said this was just like an issue with you. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I, I like I said there are questions. Like I can. Uh, like if there were questions on the presentation, I can answer them afterwards. Um, but yeah, like going back to uh, the use case I was going to show. Uh, this is the IBM website, and uh, IBM is like really big in. in like they are one of the uh, organizations behind Fabric, and they're really using it uh, with an industry partner. So. Uh, the one that I find really uh, interesting is uh, how it, uh, Walmart is using it. So if I go to, which one would it be, um, supply chain? Oh, I guess it's called supply chain. Um, or oh, consumer, it might be consumer. 
I guess my internet is uh, and my laptop in general general is just very slow. Uh, here, food safety and traceability. Um, I really want yeah this one. So this is a three minute video. Uh, it shows how Walmart is using blockchain. Can you guys hear like the video? Because I'm not sure. Like, I took a pack of mangoes. I came into my staff meeting. I put them on the table and I said, "You trace yeah, back to such such right now." And we find how long it took them to get the information for each point in the food system all the way back to the farm. And I'm not going to give you the results. <laughs> After the violence, but we have it's going to be good. <laughs> when a customer shops in our stores, we know they expect great prices. We know they expect fast, clean, and friendly service. But an unspoken expectation is that they expect the products that they buy in our stores to be safe. You know, when there's a food event or a food scare, what you want to do is you want to be fast, but you want to be right. That food product is guilty until proven innocent. the ultimate goal. Blockchain will give us the ability to not only track where food came from, but how it was. Was it produced safely? Was it produced responsibly? Is it sustainably grown? How many days of shelf life are left on that product? The food system is a shared responsibility. And for blockchain and traceability and transparency to work, we need a lot of people working together. So we're excited to be working with IBM on this blockchain initiative. But it's not just Walmart and IBM. We actually have some of our suppliers participating in this pilot. We've got some universities also participating in the pilot. And so we'll make sure that all stakeholders work together for a safer and better future. So yeah, guys, that sounds like uh, that's one of like the best example, like use cases I've seen of, uh, or the most interesting to me at least. Um, here uh, in Canada, or I guess in the U.S., uh, about how blockchain, is, how hyperledger fabric is being used in the industry with Walmart. Uh, you guys can like browse through the their other use cases. Uh, I, I think uh, IBM even partnered with uh, Bombardier to use hyperledger fabric and something. So there are like tons of use cases uh, of actual use cases being used in the industry or being considered. Yeah, so I can just uh, share this link with you guys. And you can take a look. I, I think it's uh, super interesting, uh, very useful. And it's, I, I personally find it very uh, exciting to see where we are headed uh, with all of this uh, traction that blockchain has received, especially at Ledger Fabric. Uh, so the next thing I am going to, like, initially I was going to do a, an actual like uh, walk for an application, deploy the network, uh, write uh, a client code on top of the network to interact with it. But I'm having internet issues, and so I won't be able to do that. What I will do instead is uh, show you guys an application I already wrote that uh, from before, that, and we'll go over the smart contract or chain code uh, that is used to transact to make changes to the ledger, and I will also also show the Node.js application on top of it. Uh, but before that, I am going to answer Megan's question: How do you decide between using Hyperledger or Ethereum? So I, I think like it really uh, boils down to what your uh, use cases if there is ever a need for the data that is being shared on blockchain to be private or 
to not be visible to certain parties, that's when you're going to use hyperledger fabric. But if uh, you want the data to be uh, to be public to everyone, then it's the use case. Then uh, you're going to use Ethereum and not a private blockchain platform like Hyperledger. And this is why like Hyperledger is like a very enterprise uh, platform where, for example, banks are using it because they don't they want to use the uh, they want to use some of the features that blockchain provides around immutability and. Uh, 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 the ability for the data to be secured by uh, being more robust against, against hacking, but because the data is so uh, confidential, they don't want it open to the public, and they're going to use Hyperledger Fabric as an example to uh, as a uh, platform of choice. However, if there's a consumer application where the data want, where users want, where the cell is that users have to be able to view the data, then you're going to use Ethereum. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so now, uh, are there any more questions before I go into the coding section of this? Okay, uh, I guess not. Uh, so, um, so I already have this application from before uh, when I was doing something, and uh, what I'm going to show is the chain code I wrote. Uh, yeah, so Hyperledger is for private network only. And uh, they actually just came out with version 1.3 of Hyperledger Fabric, where, in addition to the data being uh, invisible to uh, actors that are not part of the network, you can use the, they introduce this concept in a very interesting called uh, private data, where data can now become uh, private even between members of the same channel. So, say you have uh, four members that are part of the channel, and you want uh, only two members to be able to see uh, certain transactions. You use private data to uh, process those transactions. So, like only two of the three members uh, in the channel are now viewing the transaction and working with the transaction. So, uh, Hyperledger Fabric provides a lot of uh, those kind of, uh, I guess, channels and segregation of uh, the visibility of data. Um, yes, now going uh, on to the, again, I'll just show you guys like in a uh, chain code I wrote. And I don't remember where exactly I wrote it. Uh, maybe it was in a fab bar. So. so sorry. Yeah, so um chain code in um chain code in like a hyperledger fabric is written in Go and so this is like a Go file. That I wrote, and it's a very simple uh, chain code. Um, it, it was like for a demo for another thing, and uh, uh, this this is used like this uh, chain code is used. Uh, let me actually maximize it. The same. Oh, can you guys see my screen? Like I'm sharing a terminal. Maybe you guys not see this actually. Yeah, you guys can see it. Okay. So, yeah, this chain code. Uh, this was written just to demo that you can uh, transact or you can interact with the blockchain uh, network uh, through the use of two uh, uh, in, uh, through the use of two interfaces: the set uh, function and this get function. And the way it works is uh, when you deploy this uh, chain code to the network, uh, this init method is going to get called, and it will only get called the first time it's deployed to um, to the network, uh, subsequent calls uh, for subsequent deployment, for example, to upgrade the network will not call this init method again. So any initialization you want to do, it has to happen in this method. And then uh, this invoke uh, function is called every time we invoke this same code or smart contract uh, from our client. And here it checks for what's the argument to this, uh, uh, to, uh, what uh, function was being called. If it's set, then it calls this uh, set uh, interface that uh, says, like, that takes in this, these arguments and writes the key value pair to the blockchain. Uh, there's other get method I wrote, which uh, gets uh, a value from the ledger given its key. It's a very simple uh, uh, chain code that just writes and gets data from the uh, from the network, there is no other logic around it. Like you could have extended uh, the simple asset struct to uh, more fields. For example, you could have had uh, something 
like um, simple asset, maybe name, some type, string, stuff like that. You could have extended it that way, type, uh, not type, maybe maybe if the asset represents like uh, some asset which is like uh, an electronic, for example, then uh, manufacturing date, manufact manufacturing date, string. And so this was like, you could have extended it, but uh, this uh, this chain could assess what programming language I'm using. I heard. Uh, so uh, when it comes to hyperledger fabric, uh, the chain code itself is written in Go. You can write client applications uh, on top of the network to uh, call the chain code using Node.js, Java, and Go. Solidity is used only for Ethereum. It's a DSL that's like only for Ethereum. You don't use it for hyperledger fabric. Um, so I can show you like uh, maybe in fact, uh, so this was the chain code, it's written in Go. Once it's deployed, you can uh, create client applications. Uh, so like I wrote this one application um, called query.js and this uh, is written in Node.js. It queries, it's, uh, uh, it queries a uh, network which was deployed uh, to include that uh, chain code. You can note, and here you can see, like, um, if I'm query, uh, this one, uh, I guess if I start from the top, uh, it's using all these libraries. You need the fabric client uh, to talk to the net, to Hyperledger Fabric. It's, uh, this is like just setting up the fabric network. And here you're assigned, like, I guess, like, this is the most interesting part where uh, first you get, like, the user who is making the uh, call, and here you have your request where you're uh, creating the request object by specifying the chain code ID. Uh, then the function that you're uh, calling, um, well, in, like this is a different one, but uh, for the two functions we wrote, you could have uh, said uh, get here, and you could have passed in the argument uh, to say uh, maybe if something we persisted to the blockchain uh, had a key with saying uh, map, then you could pass in the argument, which would be the key to the uh, data that was added to the blockchain. And you would have just run this uh, a file, this a node, a Node.js uh, script, and it would have queried the network for this uh, piece of data. Does that answer your question? Uh, I mean, like, I, I actually, like, you know, I mean, it's quite unfortunate. I cannot demo it because uh, I need, sorry, I need, uh, I need to uh, be able to talk to. Uh, I need to put some uh, Docker images for this to work, but my internet is really bad today, so I cannot really demo it. But you can write it. Uh, you can write applications uh, using Node.js, which is what I have here, or Java or Go. This, uh, this smart contract itself can only be written in uh, Go. And so, not Python. No, Python. Uh, Python is unofficially supported. You, like I haven't seen and I've never uh, used Python to uh, work with Hyperledger Fabric. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? You know, like I feel really bad because I really wanted to do a technical demo. So what I will do is I will say, uh, make a recording of what I was going to show, and I can share that later. Uh, I think by tomorrow or uh, Tuesday, if that's fine with everyone. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Awesome. Um, are there any more questions? Um, okay, uh, so I guess, um, yeah, like, uh, we still have 10 minutes, but, like, there are no questions. I'm just going to uh, spend, I guess, uh, some time uh, tomorrow uh, creating a video for you guys so you guys can actually see how uh, we would have worked with, like, I would show how to deploy the network on your local machine, how to write a, a Node.js application or client on top of it to query and uh, write data to it. It's not going to be a long video. Like I'd make sure it's like very short. You guys can take a look. And if there are any questions, like please shoot me a message. So I guess with that, I'm going to end the call. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, I love sharing knowledge about uh, blockchain and especially Hyperledger Fabric. It's a very powerful platform. Yeah. Bye.